Welcome to the Health Chat. I'm Dr. Greg Nye. And I'm Dr. Greg Eckel. And the topic today is nutrition. Uh, we are going to kind of talk through some issues around nutrition, which is sort of a boring topic, maybe, for some people. Uh, the reason we're talking about it today is because this month, right, yes. is Nutrition Month. And so we stick with the theme. Uh, so we're going to talk it through, and also because the topic itself is so fundamental to good health. And there was a, one of the great pioneers of uh, alternative medicine once made the statement that uh, we dig our graves with our forks, which I think puts it very well. It's the foods that we eat probably does more to contribute to health or to chronic disease than anything else that we can do. So today we're going to uh, just be talking about nutrition and uh, kind of the things that everybody can do to improve their health that way. And this, this topic has become so complicated. One day you hear saturated fats aren't any good for you. Another day you hear they're very good for you. One day you hear you should be eating margarine. The next day you hear you should be eating butter. There are so many different diets out there. There's an anti-inflammatory diet. There's a specific carbohydrate diet. There's a high-fat diet. There's a high-protein diet with low-carbohydrate diet. Uh, you know, you get the picture. And you've, I'm sure you are as confused as many people as we see that come into our clinic. One of the reasons why we called our clinic Nature Cures Clinic is we are firm believers that nature does cure. Allopathic or Western medical doctors do not address diet to their lament, uh, basically, to their detriment, uh, to your detriment, um, because food is your best medicine. We have been, over the last 10 years, really addressing diet. We've pulled in a holistic nutritionist to help keep up on all of this work and education and shopping trips and menu planning. And it is amazing what food can do for you. It, you know, and just mention good food. That, good food. Uh, <laughs> that conventional docs really don't discuss diet except in the most basic principles. You know, eat less cholesterol or less saturated fat, but not specific guidelines around diet, which is astounding given that uh, I think it's been estimated that something like 75% of cancers are preventable, and much of that prevention is just through changes in diet. Um, we're eating in a way that facilitates the growth of cancer in so many different ways. It's not any particular foods. It's a general way of eating that facilitates heart disease, right. facilitates cancer, diabetes, facilitates diabetes stroke. The, the main killers, uh, we're eating in a way, as a culture, that promotes all of these. And there are very basic principles that we can follow that, that then push people in a different direction, away from developing those sort of things. So, we're going to talk today about those basic principles. What are the basic principles? The underlying foundation. I think, you know, we, you've heard us talk about a whole food diet. And by whole food, we mean it looks like the food in the wild. You know, maybe not your, maybe not your chicken or your steak or your fish. They look a little bit different because they've been prepared. But you get the vegetables that look like the vegetable. They're not prepackaged. They're not in with a lot of fillers. So, Definitely the whole food. Eating a lot of different colors of food. Yes. You know, not just, everything doesn't look the same. It should have a lot of variety of color as it sits on a plate. There's a typical, like, macrobiotic approach that we um, promote, which is eating locally, eating in season. You don't want to really be importing your food from around the globe. I mean, yeah, sometimes it's nice to get mangoes in February in the Northwest, um, mm -hmm. you know, which they are very ripe right now. But... It, you know, typically you want to eat what is in right. your locale. Obviously, those mangoes travel a long they way. They travel a long way. So, you know, we look at it at the individual level, and then we also want to look at it globally as far as, you know, environmentally, how, what are we creating in the world, and how, the, how does your consumer dollar drive what happens out there with our food? Um, there's some really great movements on a whole foods diet. Uh, getting junk food out of schools is a huge one changing how the USDA is subsidized so we're not subsidizing farmers to create crap for our kids to eat that then creates diabetes at age 10. I mean, these are huge concepts. Um, empty calories is another one that we want to talk about. And you touched about on the cancer component on, you know, it's really about what, how does that food behave in your body? How does that drive your physiology and biochemistry? And then how does that set you up for disease? You know, chronic illness is a huge burden 
to the individual in the U.S. and as, as our whole society goes. And so much of that can be cleaned up with diet alone. Um, what other component do we want to mention? In well, that? around the whole foods issue, I would just, you know, coming back to that, one of the principles that we really coach people on and that Maria, who does shopping uh, trips with people, show them how to shop, stay to the edge of the supermarket, which is to say that generally processed foods are in the middle. They have boxes with nice colors and, and lists of ingredients that are a whole paragraph long. And when you stay to the perimeter, you're seeing the fruits and the vegetables and generally the meats and dairy. And um, so the whole foods tend to get pushed to the sides, eggs and those sort of things, and, and the processed foods in the middle. So that's a very simple principle to stay toward the outside and minimize your time on the inside and you'll tend to have more whole foods that way. So that's content of what you're putting in there. Now environment on how you eat is also very important. Um, you know, all too often you see people driving in their car, shoving down the, the toast or the scone or whatever that simple carbohydrate is. Um, we don't recommend that. In fact, we recommend sitting down to eat. <laughs> don't stand up. Uh, all too often I hear patients say, well, you know, I'm really busy in the morning. I'm preparing stuff for the kids. Uh, you know, I'm running around, I'm taking bites, and I'm getting everything going. You know, there is the, the reality of time, I suppose, right. that we've all agreed upon that sometimes that ne is necessary, but maybe if it means waking up 15 minutes early so that you can actually sit down right. and get out of the sympathetic dominant state. The sympathetic dominant, what that does is it's the saber-toothed cat is coming to eat you, and it shunts blood out of your gut, goes to the muscles into your eyes so that you can see fight or flight. That, it, you're not going to digest your burger right. when you're in a sympathetic dominant <laughs> state. All too often, irritable bowel, all kinds of GERD or heartburn, gas and bloating, all of those things can be averted or at least minimized by just that one act of I sitting mean, down. It is almost invariable that people with digestive issues will say that their symptoms are worse under stress. Right. And that's exactly what that is. They're eating under stress. Sympathetic yeah. dominance and it shuts down. All right, let's move on. One, well, one, actually, one more on that, which enough. I think is really important, is uh, eating consciously and oh, yeah. chewing your yeah. food. Right. right, right. So those Spending are two. Spending time actually yeah. noticing that you're putting food in your mouth and Even chewing it. Even having Ideally, a sense of gratitude. until it's liquid. Yeah. Which, it, That's when tough. I mention that principle to people, there's a gasp at, <laughs> <laughs> because it takes consciousness. It, you know, it takes awareness of every bite that's going in to stay with it and chew it until it is liquid. And that's the I, that's how food is supposed to be coming into the stomach. That's how we're set up. digested yeah. so that then uh, it carries on from there. But so often we're in a hurry and we're not thinking, we're reading, we're done, and it, and it just it goes down the tube way before it's supposed Yeah, to. and you know, I kind of put that into like a mindful meditation, a mindfulness of, you know, a sense of gratitude of recognizing that you have this food that is nourishing your body. Um, that is hard to maintain at every meal, I will tell you. I, oh, yeah. I try to practice that, and it's a hard one to remember at every meal. But It's hard to remember anytime. Like, two bites per <laughs> meal. Right. But it's, it's not that, you know, it's not to you start the day saying, I'm going to chew every bite until, until it's liquid. <laughs> but right. you just have the, the conscious intention that whenever you think of it, bring your awareness to what you're eating and chew it until it's liquid. Before you swallow. Now, no talk about nutrition would be complete without a don't list. Oh, yeah. Okay. And an avoid. So we've got definitely fried foods, not beneficial. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, there are certain things that just no one who is striving to be healthier should eat them. They're just not intended as food. They're only intended as, as ways of making us get addicted to a taste. High fructose corn High syrup. High fructose corn syrup, great yeah. example. Driving an enormous amount of blood sugar problems in our society and diabetes now in kids who are drinking enormous amounts of high fructose corn syrup in their drinks. And I think they're even showing that that particular compound blocks leptin, which is the satiety. It stops you from being satiated, so you don't become full. So it's a kind of a trick of the food industry. One, they got away from sugar because sugar became, you know, driving up insulin and creating all of these health problems. So they thought, well, here's high fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Let's use that. Yeah. Uh, and now it's coming to show, well, there's actually some addictive qualities to that. Yeah, absolutely. Another that I think trans fats, I think everybody knows now, and even right. states like New York have, have uh, 
outlawed trans bats. Right. Um, but one that is not outlawed yet, for reasons that I don't understand, are the hydrogenated right. oils. And on virtually every uh, packaged baked product, some right. flour baked product, if you read the list of ingredients, there are either um, hydrogenated oils or partially hydrogenated oils. And those oils are foreign to the body. They get incorporated into our cells, but they don't behave the way that normal oils do, the healthy oils. So there's nothing, absolutely nothing uh, healthy about taking in a hydrogenated oil. And our habit should be that we look at every label, and if it has it, you just don't eat it. That's it. It's that simple. Um, there, there are a few of those very clear cut. You just never do. Right. And high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oils, fall on that list. I put farm raised fish on there too. Oh yeah, and that's any Atlantic. Atlantic salmon. salmon. There's Atlantic no. Salmon. So if you go to a restaurant, natural pretty salmon much left. any restaurant that is not you know kind of a specialty restaurant, if you're ordering salmon, it's almost always going to be farmed. And, and that's a good thing to ask. What is is this farm salmon or is this wild? Um, and you just don't, you don't eat farm. And there are reasons that we can't get into. Now we've got a, a minimized list. Um, minimized alcohol and caffeine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not anti-caffeine. I think a lot of naturopathic doctors are anti-caffeine. I think there's enough research to support some of the health benefits of it. But I do believe we're over-caffeinated as a society. Um, coming from the land of uh, baristas, it's almost sacrilege to say that out here. Right. So I, we actually have covered the windows so that nobody will <laughs> snipe us. Um, but, uh, and you know, we, we do see quite a few folks that work in coffee shops out here in Portland, but right. um, we don't have anything against caffeine. But too much caffeine is a detriment. It's a, it's a dehy it'll uh, dehydrate you. And, uh, and when people use it to get through their day, Right. That's clearly a problem. We call that you're mobilizing your troops, not fortifying them. Yeah. Um, we are also going to include, you'll see here, a list of the uh, top, top dozen foods to avoid for pesticide use. And, um, and then we've got also the top 12 uh, vegetables with the least pesticide amount. That will be coming up there as well. Uh, let's see. We, let's try to get through a few more basic principles. Um, Let's talk about fats. I find a lot of fats, folks do not have absolutely. beneficial fats in their diet. Most people think of fat as a universal negative, and in fact, fats are incredibly important in the diet. And so there are sources of fat that are very important to get in, including the fats found in nuts, avocados, flax, olive, olive oil, olive oil yeah. um, fried fats, vegetable fats generally we are way over consuming and so we need to minimize the you know the canola and the safflower yeah. and, and cotton seed should never be eaten and this ties into that omega 3 omega 6 omega 9 balance that you know i think a lot of folks are now tuned into omega 3s are really heart beneficial and you know i think even cheerios now advertises that on their box yeah, um, yeah. which we don't or we're not putting a plug in for cheerios <laughs> or the um, or processed cereals for that matter right. but uh, Definitely getting in the high omega-3 oils and essential fatty acids, so definitely the flax, evening primrose oil, along those lines. You don't cook with those. Um, we've got some information on our site for those as well. Um, and if you have any questions about that stuff, definitely you can email us as well because we know it can be complex. We're trying to just make it simple uh, and uh, just basic guidelines yeah. today. Then uh, the, the guideline on protein intake, uh, is a very simple one to follow, and that is one to two grams per kilogram of body weight. So you can go onto your computer and convert your body weight to kilograms, and basically that's an activity level that determines do you go high, acti you know, very high activity people go closer to two grams per kilogram, more sedentary people closer to one gram per kilogram. Uh, and of course, the source of the protein is good, and that is really looking at. Um, Organic, organic grass-fed, yeah, uh, along those lines. All right, so that is our talk on basic guidelines for nutrition today. Now, hopefully that has not stirred up more questions for you, but if you do have questions, please e email them in. We love answering those. It's questions at naturecuresclinic.com.